You let us know when to start, Sarah. We're, we're dependent on you. You're taking time. Let me know. Give me the go. Okay, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, God's eternal Son, we begin. Do keep me informed when my microphone starts cutting. Uh, before I begin with the positive case, demonstrating the deity of the Lord Jesus from the Holy Scriptures, I need to first define what we believe and what we don't believe. As Trinitarians, who base our belief on the authority of Scripture, we believe that the one eternal God exists in three eternally distinct yet inseparable persons, the person of the Father, the person of the Son, and the person of the Holy Spirit. Um, hold on one second. Fire just distracted me. One second, please. Sorry about that, Dow. Hold on. Um, Sarah said, go. Fire, you say, let us pray. You told me that right in the middle of my speech. By the grace of God, let's get organized before we move on. Can we go yes or no? Let me know when officially we begin. I don't want to be robbed of my time. Hold on, Dow. Let's see. Are we ready? Please put a one in the text. We gotta all be agreed. Okay. Let us begin. Please do not distract me with any side notes as I'm beginning my presentation. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, let me begin my presentation. Before I present the positive case from the Holy Scriptures, I like to define what we believe and what we do not believe as Bible-believing Trinitarians. As I stated, we believe in one eternal God, existing in three eternally distinct, yet inseparable persons. The person of the Father, the person of the Son, and the person of the Holy Spirit. We do not believe that Jesus is the Father or the Holy Spirit. We believe He is the second person of the Trinity. Therefore, any references in the Scripture that show Jesus communicating or having fellowship with another, whom we identify in the Scriptures as the Father, does not refute the deity of Christ. All it establishes that is that there are two distinct persons communicating with one another, which is what the doctrine of the Trinity says. Father and Son are distinct persons, along with the Holy Spirit, making a total of three persons. We also believe that the Lord Jesus Christ became a true human being, yet without sin. So according to the Scriptures, as God, He remained immutable. His divine nature and essence did not change or cease. Yet His human nature grew and changed, as all human beings do. So we believe He is fully God and fully human, two natures united in one person, perfectly. So any statements on Christ growing, or getting tired, or fatiguing, or eating, as an argument against the deity of Christ, only exposes a gross fundamental misunderstanding of the doctrine of the Trinity and the incarnation of the eternal Word of God who became man. Now with those qualifications, let me get, begin with the positive case from the Scriptures that Jesus, who is God and man, has all the attributes of deity, as well as having the attributes of humanity without ceasing to be God. I'm going to try to limit myself as best as I can to the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now fire. I want you to post these passages to demonstrate that Christ has the omni-attributes of God. That He's omniscient, He's omnipotent, and He's omnipresent. Demonstrating clearly that He is fully God, in essence and nature, and He's distinct from the Father and the Holy Spirit, because all three exist as one God. Quote for me Matthew 18, verse 20. Matthew 18, verse 20. The Lord Jesus is omnipresent. Matthew 18, verse 20. And here I'm going to demonstrate from the lips of Christ as documented in the New Testament. Now, the debate is not on the authenticity of the New Testament. We're trying to take the New Testament as it stands today and see, do the New Testament documents teach the deity of Christ? And then we will debate the authenticity of the Bible versus the Quran later, Lord Jesus willing. Matthew 18, 20. Fire, I need you to pop those verses quick. Now, this is the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what Christ says. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Christ claims to be present with all believers who are gathered in His name. This is a claim of omnipresence. Where two or three are gathered in My name, there am I in the midst of them. Matthew 28, verse 20. Let me know how I'm doing on time. Matthew 28, verse 20. Matthew 28, verse 20. What does the Lord Jesus say there? Turn to Matthew 28, 20, and you'll see Jesus says, And surely, or lo, 
I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. Here in the Gospel of Matthew 28, verse 20, Christ claims to be personally present with all believers to the end of the age. Now, Father, you've got to pick it up. I want you to notice the text. It's there. I am with you always to the end of the age, even to the end of the age. Again, a claim of omnipresence of the highest degree. He's not just present with some believers. He's present, present with all believers and to the end of the age. What about John? Chapter 14, verse 20 to 21. By the grace of God, as His Holy Spirit guides my mouth, John 14, 20 to 21. Fire, we want to demonstrate the omni-attributes of the Lord Jesus from His own mouth and work our way from there. To demonstrate clearly, Christ is God and man, not either or. He's both man and He's the second person of the Trinity. The Christian church derives its doctrine from the authority of the Scriptures, expressing the biblical teaching the best they could. In John 14, 20 to 21, fire quickly. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Notice here, Jesus says, He's in the Father. The believers are in Christ. Now the reason why believers are in Christ, here's the key. I am in you. Christ is saying He is in all believers. He's in all of us. And the reason why He's in all of us is because He's omnipresent. This is why we can be in Him. No matter where we are, we are in Him because He's present everywhere. And then He says in verse 21, He that hath my commandments and keeps them, he is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest, show myself to him. Christ claims to show himself to all who love him. A claim of omnipresence. Now fire, John 14, 23. And fire, preferably if you could use a modern translation, that would be easier on my tongue uh, as opposed to old, uh, old English or King James Version. John 14, 23. Preferably another translation that's more clear in English, fire. John 14, 23. Here's what the Lord Jesus says. Now notice here, guys, He's going to claim equality with the Father. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we, notice, plural, we will come to him and make our abode with him. Jesus says he with the Father together will come to all believers and live with them. This is not just a claim of omnipresence, it's also a claim of co-equality with the Father. Now John 17, verse 23. John 17, verse 23. Quote that for me. John 17, verse 23. As long as it's modern English, I don't mind fire. John 17, verse 23. Here's what the Lord Jesus says about His omnipresence. And then we're going to go into His omniscience. Christ is all-knowing. I in them. Notice here everyone in the text. Jesus says, I in them. I am in them. Again, a claim of omnipresence. And thou in me, you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Fire, are you sure this is the New King James Version? This does not sound like the New King James Version. Let me give you a link to use. Hold on. Sarah, maybe you can switch with fire because Old English is rough on my tongue. Again, let me give you another verse. John 17, 26. John 17, 26. Sarah, please, quickly. By the grace of the Lord Jesus, my time is limited. I need to establish the case from Scripture from the lips of Jesus, what He says. John 17, verse 26. Isn't it amazing? During my uh, presentation, we have all these difficulties. John 17, verse 26. I'm going to wait here. I'm going to let my time run out until you guys figure out what translation you're going to use. John 17, 26. So guys, we're going to wait here until my time runs out, until they, until they can get the translation. All right. John 17, 26. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Notice again, Christ is in believers. He is in us all. Like the Father, He is with us all. He makes His home with us alongside the Father. A claim of omnipresence and co-equality. What about omniscience? What about His omniscience? John 16, verse 30 to 31. John 16, verse 30 to 31. What does the Lord Jesus say here? John 16, verse 30 to 31. 
Here, he's going to confess and testify that he is all-knowing. John 16, 30 to 31. Quote that for me, please. John 16, 30 to 31. In John 16, 30 to 31, the Lord Jesus says what? Now you can see that you know all things. Now notice, this is the testimony of his disciples. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. We can see you know all things. This makes us believe that you came from God. The Lord Jesus comes from God the Father because He is not the Father. And then what does Jesus respond? You believe at last, Jesus answered. Instead of correcting them and saying, no, I don't know all things, He says, you finally believe that I know all things, all-knowing deity in the flesh. What about John 21.17? John 21.17. Someone post that for me. John 21.17. Here again, Peter confesses and acknowledges that the Lord standing before him is the omniscient deity in flesh, the all-knowing God-man. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. Again, note, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. Here again, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 2, verse 23 to 25. According to the testimony of the evangelist, Christ knows every man and knows what is in a man. Christ knows every man and knows what is in a man. Now, while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. They believed in his name. Now notice, verses 24 to 25. Let me know how much time I got. Don't tell me when it's only one minute left. Go ahead, Sarah. John 2, 23 to 25, verse 24. Notice here. They came to him because of the signs he did. They started believing in his name. And we'll wait for Sarah to quote 24 to 25. Now, while he was in Jerusalem, at the Passover feast, many people saw the miraculous signs he was doing and believed in his name. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all men. Not only does he know all things, according to the disciples, which he confirmed their testimony, here he, he knows all men. He did not eat man's testimony about man, for he knew what was in a man. He knew what was inside a man. He knew all men. He knew all things. He lives with all believers. He indwells all believers. That's omniscience and omnipotence. John 14, 13 to 14. Sarah, John 14, 13 to 14. I got so many references. I just got to deal with the time. John 14, 13 to 14. John 14, 13 to 14. Quickly, Sarah, my time is going... It's almost up. John 14, 13 to 14. Sarah, quickly, please. John 14, 13 to 14. All right. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. Notice here what Jesus said. He will answer our prayers. I will do whatever you ask in my name. So the Son bring, bring glory to the Father. You may ask me. Make your request known to me. Ask for anything in my name. I will do it. Now note, Christ says, ask him personally. He also says he will answer prayer. Well, in order for Christ to know who's praying to him, he has to have the knowledge of the prayers being offered up to him. And in order for him to answer prayer, he must be all-powerful. So here from the lips of Jesus, he's all-powerful and he is omniscient. Turn to Revelation 1, 7 to 8. Revelation 1, 7 to 8. Revelation 1, 7 to 8, please, quickly. Revelation 1, 7 to 8. Notice these passages. Christ claims all the omni-attributes of God. And this is what we believe. He is fully God, fully human, two natures, one person, distinct from the Father and the Spirit, existing as the one God. And the debate is, is Jesus God? Clearly is from the Scriptures. And I'll refute any other arguments that Dawah seeks to bring against this case. Revelation 1, 7 to 8, by the grace of the Lord Jesus. Revelation 1, 7 to 8. In Revelation 1, 7, 7 to 8, here is what the scriptures say. Notice, a vision that John has of the Lord. Behold, he comes with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. I want you to notice this. Every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Notice the one who's coming is the one who's pierced. The very one nailed on the cross, for Jesus the Lord is. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. 
And then, notice verse 8. The one who's coming is the one who's pierced. Catch that. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. Who is and who was, who is to come. The one coming in verse 7 is the one pierced. And the one coming in verse 8 says, He is the Almighty. The one who's to come, the Almighty. From the lips of Jesus, He is Almighty. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. Revelation 1, 17 to 18. I have a lot more, but my time is limited. Revelation 1, 17 18. Here Jesus applies to Himself the very title of the God of the Old Testament. And interestingly, the Quran agrees in chapter 57, verse 3, that this is the title of the Almighty God. In chapter 57, verse 3 of the Quran, this is the title of the Almighty God. And what is it? When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I'm alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Here Jesus, the one who lives, who died and lives again, says he's the first and the last. According to Isaiah 44, verse 6, and according to Isaiah 48, verse 12, Isaiah 44, verse 6, and Isaiah 48, verse 12, Jehovah says, I am the first and the last. The very title of the God of the Old Testament in, in Scripture is used by Jesus for himself. The one who died and lived says he is the first and the last, a title of Jehovah of the Old Testament. He is the Almighty. He knows all things. He is present everywhere. And this is just a warm-up. How much time I got? This is just a warm-up. I haven't even begun the evidence. Is my time up? How much time? Come on, people. This is what the Lord says, Israel's King and Redeemer, the Lord Almighty. I'm the first and I'm the last. Apart from me, there is no God. All right, Sarah. Revelation 2.23. Okay, time is up. Dawa, bring it on, brother. Let's get it on. Let's get ready to rumble. Jesus is God to the glory of the Father. Amen. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I start in the name of Allah the creator of the universe and the creator of Jesus Christ peace be upon him and all the prophets and all the creation رب شرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفهو قولي Alright this debate right now is about the divinity of Jesus Christ peace be upon him was he God or was he just a human being Okay, first of all, before I start, if I'm coming, my sound is okay, please type 1, Sarah or Fire. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Alright, you could start the time now. God, by definition, He is one, both according to the Bible and according to the Quran. And God has different attributes, both according to the Bible, according to the dictionary, and according to the Quran. God is omnipresent. God, God is omniscient. God is all-powerful. God is the creator and other attributes. And these attributes, I know Sam also agrees. Answering Islam also agrees. So all we have to do is if any one of the attributes is lacking from the nature of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that means all the evidence which answering Islam provided will just shatter. And I'm here to present, just using the Bible, those attributes. First of all, God is all-knowing. That means he knows the past, he knows the present, and he knows the future. If we look at the Bible, the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 13, verse number 32, and this is what Jesus Christ says. Let me paste that verse up here. Alright. Why is my text disabled? Okay, I'm just going to read it. Jesus Christ is saying that of the last day, no one knows of that day or that hour. Yeah, that would be great, Sarah, if you could uh, post. That would be very fair of you. Yeah. 
yes, answering, help in posting, but not helping the refuting or you know presenting my view. Yes, Jesus Christ. This is the mouth of Jesus Christ. He's saying, no one knows of that day or of that hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Here, Jesus Christ, if he were God. He is saying that he does not know what is going to happen in the future. That means he is disqualifying himself and important point, he is also disqualifying the Holy Spirit from being as all-knowing. He is giving the credit only to the Father and to this person, this entity, we Muslims worship. And now answering may come back and tell me that yeah, because he was a human being, because of his limited knowledge, uh, you know, Jesus Christ is not saying about what is going to happen in the future. He's speaking from his human side. But remember, this knowledge, the question the person is asking to Jesus Christ is about the knowledge of the future. So he's asking about the knowledge of the future and Jesus Christ, if he were God, he would have answered him explicitly. But Jesus Christ says, no one knows, neither him, but only the Father. So two points. Jesus Christ is not all-knowing, and Holy Spirit is all, not all-knowing. Or else, Jesus Christ would have included Holy Spirit in this passage along with the Father. Point number two. Gospel of John chapter number 17 verse number 3 if someone could post that would be great in this passage Jesus Christ is behind him he mentions that there is only one true God and Jesus Christ is referring to his father John 17 verse number 3 so again Jesus Christ is disqualifying himself from being God and he's disqualifying the Holy Spirit from being God and he's calling Father as the only true God now let's take a look at John chapter number yes John 17 verse number 3 and this is life eternal that they may know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent so according to answering Islam's argument that Jesus Christ was fully God and fully human, this disqualifies because the word only true God are very explicit, unlike the vague statements which answering Islam was presenting. And yes, alright, if we move to John chapter number 14, verse number 28. If you could pose that would be great. In this passage, John chapter number 14, verse number 28, Jesus Christ explicitly mentions that my Father is greater than I. And we know that there is no one greater than God and Jesus Christ is saying that the Father is greater than I. Again disqualifies Jesus Christ as being God. Alright, if we move to verse number, John chapter number uh, 10, verse number 29. It again says, if you could post that Sarah, it would be great. John 10, verse number 29. In this verse, in this verse, Jesus Christ is saying explicitly that my Father is greater than all. that the Father is greater than all. That means, again, Jesus Christ is disqualifying Himself and disqualifying the Holy Spirit because the word all is there. That means, again, Jesus Christ cannot be God and the Holy Spirit cannot be God. If you look at this verse. Yeah, if you look at the guess after this, we could talk about that hopefully in the rebuttal. Next point. There is no explicit verse in all of the Bible where Jesus Christ himself mentions 
that I am God. And this is a challenge to answering Islam and to all Christians who are here and who are not here. Present us a verse which is clear and explicit, which Jesus Christ says that I am God. Challenge number two to Sam, answering Islam. Where does Jesus Christ say that I am fully human and I am fully God? Logically, even if you would have taken logic 101, you know that an infinite and a finite cannot exist in one and the same person. That means a person cannot be independent and dependent simultaneously. That's illogical. So if you are saying that God transformed himself into a human being, that means he's no longer God. The same analogy, if you, if you change a circle into a square, it is no longer a circle. You cannot have a circle and a square one and the same time. They are mutually ex exclusive. All right, my next point. Even if you, my next point, okay, let me backtrack. My next point, all the prophets or all the people, all the messengers who came before Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, they all proclaimed the oneness of God without any attaching any partners to him. If you look at Abraham and David and Jacob and Ishmael and Abraham and all the prophets, even in your own book, no one explicitly proclaimed Trinity. Okay? That means, if all the prophets proclaim the oneness of God without attaching the Holy Spirit or Son as part of that God, that means you, ha you are contradicting. If you are saying Trinity is true and Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then you are contradicting your own Bible and your own prophets who are present in the Old Testament. Alright, next point. Even if you could prove that Jesus Christ is God from the Bible, then you are left with the stigma of worshipping two gods. You could prove from the Bible whatever proof that you bring and in, in your heart of hearts if you believe that Jesus Christ is God, then you are left with the stigma that Jesus Christ is God and Father is God. But you could never prove that these two entities could be one and the same. Because Bible presents them as distinct entities and in your opening statement you have mentioned that these are two distinct persons. So whatever proof that you bring that Jesus Christ is God then you are stuck with the dilemma that you are worshipping two gods. If you are doing that, that you are contradicting God and Jesus and Bible and all the prophets and logic, then you are a polytheist. Alright, all the verses that you have mentioned that Jesus Christ has the attributes of God, know that Jesus Christ himself mentions in the Bible. John chapter number 5 verse number 30 if Sarah if you could pose that John chapter number 5 verse number 30 in here Jesus Christ is saying I of myself cannot do anything yes John chapter 5 verse number 30 it says by myself I cannot do anything I judge as I hear and my judgment is just, for I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. God is not sent by anyone. Only messengers and prophets are sent by God. That means Jesus Christ is saying, all things which are given to him are coming from God. So any passage that you mention from the Bible that Jesus Christ has the capacity to forgive sins or capacity to do, to do miracles and any passage that you bring to prove the divinity of Christ this passage you are left with the stigma that all power which is coming to Jesus Christ is given by God and to that God 
we Muslims worship. Okay, I have three more minutes. Let me continue then. Let me continue. Answering Islam, you have presented a good case which you think is good that Jesus Christ is God. But you could never prove that the two distinct persons that you, are pro that you are proving both them to be God, that they are one and the same. And let me, let me quote you from your own Christian scholars. They say that the Trinity that you believe in was not formulated up until many centuries after Jesus Christ was gone. What is my reference? My reference is the Catholic Encyclopedia. My reference is uh, the interpreter's Bible, my reference is various commentaries of the Bible, all of them say that the Trinity was developed or evolved centuries after Jesus Christ was gone. So you may try your best answering Islam to prove that a human being is God, but if you, but then you are left with the stigma that you are worshipping two gods. If you are not worshipping two gods, then the burden of proof is on you. Okay? Listen to this very carefully. The burden is, of proof is on you to prove that the two gods are Jesus Christ and Father, whom you say that both are gods, that they are both one and the same God. You are left with that stigma. And let me mention from my holy book, the Muslim holy book, the Quran, which was given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. It says in chapter number 5, verse number 72 and other places that don't call Jesus Christ as God. Jesus Christ was a human being. Many prophets, they came before him. Jesus Christ used to eat and he had the human attributes. So all of these are refutation to your uh, so-called proof that Jesus Christ is God. And lastly, if they, according to your reasoning, if there are any attributes that you are thinking are matching with the attributes of God, like Alpha and Omega, the reference itself that you have mentioned, many scholars dispute the book of Revelation. And some Bibles does not even mention that reference. Okay, with this, I think I have proven my point that Jesus Christ is not God and there is only one God and to this God and I invite you to worship. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Sam. Let me know when I can school this guy for his misinformation. Let me know. I'm ready to wipe out the arguments by the grace of God. This is easier than I thought. Okay, by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, let me correct all your misinformation and your misinterpretation of the scripture. Let me first deal with your, your so-called appeal to logic. This is why I stated earlier, you think you're being logical, and again, this is not an attack on you, but you commit some of the grossest logical fallacies I've seen. Let me give you an example. You assume that oneness precludes plurality of persons. Yet you and I both believe that the unity of God does not exclude the fact that he can have a plurality of some sorts. You affirm a plurality of attributes. I not only affirm that the one God has a plurality of attributes, but he also has a plurality of persons. Unity does not exclude plurality. You can have unity in plurality, plurality in unity. The erroneous assumption that you're operating on is that unless you have singularity, you cannot have unity. Neither the Old Testament nor the Bible teaches God is a singularity. It teaches that God is a plurality of attributes and persons within one being. Please, stop appealing to logic because it doesn't help you. Then you committed another uh, <coughs> logical fallacy called the categorical fallacy. You said that you can't have a squared circle and then liken that to God becoming man. Again, this demonstrates your logical fallacy because God and man are not from the same category. Squares and circles belong to the same category of shapes, but you can have a red, uh, red circle or a yellow square because they belong to two different categories. 
So two things from two different categories can unite together. God is a category unto himself, and man is a category unto himself. And God can become man without ceasing to be God. So enough of your categorical fallacies. Let me correct another fallacy before I refute your misinterpretation of those passages. You said that that verse from Revelation does not exist in the Bible. Let me correct your misinformation. What the verse that the scholars hold into question wasn't Revelation 1, 7 to 8, nor was it Revelation 1, uh, 17, 18. The passage you're alluding to is Revelation 1, 11. But I didn't quote Revelation 1, 11. I quoted Revelation 1, 7 to 8 and 1, 17, 18, and no scholar disputes the authenticity of those passages as belonging to the book of Revelation. Then you try to shift the debate to the authorship of Revelation and its authenticity. That is for another debate. The debate we're having today, does the New Testament, as it exists, teach the deity of Christ? The fact that you have to attack the authority of Revelation demonstrates that you do agree that it teaches the deity of Christ, so you have to brush it aside. So thank you for indirectly proving my point that the New Testament, as it stands, teaches the deity of Christ. Now let me go back to some of the uh, passages alluded to to refute you. You said Mark 13.32 excludes the omniscience of the Holy Spirit. On the contrary, you have misread Mark 13.32. In context, Mark 13.32, Jesus wasn't referring to the Holy Spirit. When he says, of the day or hour no one knows, he's referring to no human being. How do we know? Because he goes on to say, neither the angels nor the Son but the Father. No one here is qualified in the context as referring to no man. If no one meant everyone, there'd be no need for Jesus to go on, to go on and say that neither the angels nor the Son know that, because the term no one would have included them. The fact that he goes on and qualifies it, and makes a distinction between the term no one and the angels and the Son, clearly shows in context he's referring to human beings, he's not including every single creature, and this is why he goes on to qualify the statement. Now let me show you that the Holy Spirit does know all things. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. Please, my time is limited. I'll have a field though refuting this guy. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. Again, my time is limited. I don't mean to rush. Bear with me. I'll repeat my points, uh, Lord willing, a little later. Uh, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. Here clearly the Holy Spirit knows everything, knows the very mind of God. Guys, my time is running out. You guys got to be faster in posting these passages. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. But God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God knows the thoughts of God, knowing the mind of God, because the Spirit is omniscient. So let me correct that misinformation and misinterpretation of Mark 13.32. You appeal to John 14.28 and John 5.30. Let me deal with both those passages. You misquoted both passages. You quoted John 5.30, but ignored the context. In John 5.30, Jesus does say he can do nothing of his own initiative. But this shows that you do not understand what the Bible teaches about the Trinity. The Trinity doctrine entails that the three persons of the Godhead do not do anything independently from one another. In other words, neither the Father, nor the Son, nor the Spirit work independently, but in perfect unity, in perfect harmony. So when the Son says He can do nothing on His own, He's speaking of the fact that He doesn't work independently of His Father, but in perfect harmony. And this is precisely what the doctrine of the Trinity says. But if you had read the passage in context, you'd go on to say, see Jesus claiming to be God and having the attributes of God. Now let's begin and read the context, which you conveniently ignored as you did with all the other passages. John 5, 19-21. Quickly quote it so I can correct the misinformation and misinterpretation of my Holy Scripture, the true Word of God, the Holy Bible. John 5, 19-21. Let us see what Jesus meant in context. When he says, I can do nothing, that's an affirmation of the perfect unity of the persons of the Godhead. They do not work independently, but in perfect unity. But because Jesus is God, He can do everything that the Father does. And here is the context which you conveniently ignored and twisted. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by Himself. This is what you emphasize, but go on. He can only do what He sees His Father doing. Because whatever, notice this Dawah, this is for you, whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Now, I want everyone in the room to pay attention to Jesus' words in context. 
He says he doesn't do anything alone. But he does everything in perfect union with the Father because he's inseparable from the Father. And he can do everything that the Father does. But what the Father does, only God can do. And Jesus says he can do it. Here's the proof. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all, all he does. Yes, to your amazement, he will show him even greater things than these. Sarah, quote the rest of it. 21 to 23, quickly. 21 to 23. You're fortunate the time is running out because that's in your favor because I'd wipe your arguments to shreds. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, notice, just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so, the Son, His Son, who can do nothing apart from the Father, but can do everything that the Father does, the Son gives life to whom He is pleased to give it. Notice the Son can give life just as the Father gives life, because Father and the Son, being the one God, can do all things perfectly and together. Now notice here, moreover, the Father judges is no one, but has entrusted all judgment to the Son, all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Catch that point, people. Jesus doesn't say, honor me as you honor a prophet. Honor me as you honor your mother and father. Honor me as you honor your neighbor. Honor me just as you honor the Father. And the honor we give to the Father is worship. So Christ from his own mouth says, worship as you worship the Father. And he says, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. John 5.25. John 5.25. Quickly from the lips of Jesus. John 5.25. And in my other rebuttal period, I'm going to annihilate all your misquotations by the grace of God. John 5.25, what does he say there? In John 5.25, there, I'm going to quit, my time is up. John 5.25, and 28 times. 29 to 20. John 5, to 5, 20, Sarah, not 35. Sarah, you're working against me here. John 5.25, not 35. And verses 28 to 29. John 5.25 and 28 to 29. Quickly, Sarah, i got to get this in to show you how he misquoted John 5.30. Now notice, this is all the context of John 5.30. Sarah, go ahead. This year, Sarah, okay. Here's what Jesus says, now, the context of John 5.30. I tell you the truth, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear whose voice? The voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Now verses 28 to 29. Look at the power of the voice of the Son of God. His voice is all-powerful because He's God Almighty. Verses 28 to 29, He says this, when the dead hear the voice of the Son of God, what will happen, Sarah? Let me end it with this. Quickly, Sarah. Move it, Sarah. Come on, Sarah. 28 to 29. Come on. Sarah, you got to be faster. Sarah, my time is up. I have to yield the mic. Sarah, you got to be faster. 28 to 29, please. 28 to 29. All right, time. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for helping me. Appreciate it, sister. Okay, Dawa, your mic. Don't misquote scripture again. Here it goes. Do not be amazed at this, for time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear His voice. Whose voice? The voice of the Son of God. And those who are here will come out of their graves. Anyway, Dawa, you'll have an extra minute. Give him 11 minutes, because I took more than... Come out of their graves. Anyway, Dawa, you'll have an extra minute. Give him 11 minutes, because I took more than... أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقهوا قولي I greet all of you again with the greeting of peace be upon all of you Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah Yes, you could start it now Alright, answering Islam What you have did is you have repeated the same thing that you have done in your first uh, 15 minutes Nothing new I gave you many challenges and you failed to present those challenges. Challenge number one, show me from the Bible that if Jesus is God, where does he explicitly say that I am God? That challenge you never were able to fulfill. Strike against you. Challenge number two, even if you could prove in your own delusions that Jesus is God, that means you are stuck with the stigma that you are worshipping two gods. That means you are a polytheist. Challenge number three, that I gave it to you. That Jesus Christ, he disqualifies himself in Mark chapter number 13, verse number 32. If you look at the context of it, Jesus Christ says, if Sarah, if you could post up the verse again, would be great. Mark chapter number 13, verse number 32. It says, no one knows, no man, no angel, 
neither the son that means Jesus Christ is saying neither the son that means he is disqualifying himself from being knowing the future and he could have mentioned Holy Spirit knows it and Father knows it but he did not he only mentions that only the Father thanks Sarah that means you don't have any good reputation for it and you lost on that one John chapter number 17 verse number 3 again Jesus Christ pointing to his father he says that there is only one true God Jesus Christ mentions that the father is the only true God if you could pose that again Sarah would be great John, John chapter 17 verse number 3 again over here Jesus Christ disqualifies the Holy Spirit he could have mentioned the name of Holy Spirit but he did not alright you mentioned that I am using the fallacy categorical fallacy I think you are using the fallacy uh, answering once a square becomes a circle it no longer is a square doesn't matter they are from the both uh, they have the both same lines and whatever it is no longer a square if you change a circle into a square it's no longer a circle likewise if God has to lose his attributes or God has to become a human being God is no longer a God God is no longer infinite God is no longer independent he is dependent okay point the next point about the revelation words that you have quoted my point on the revelation is that there are other places where Alpha and Omega are mentioned and those places the modern translations they have deleted those verses so again the stigma for you is if one place in the revelation if people could interpolate about the Alpha and Omega words what is the guarantee that you have that the words that you are quoting on Alpha and Omega is not an interpolation again the burden of proof is on you and then there are conflicting reports that there are conflicting reports in your own New Testament about the personality of Jesus Christ peace be upon him in one place according to you that he is divine but on other places he is just a plain human being because of this confusion listen to this carefully because of this confusion many Christians that I have interacted with they don't take Jesus to be divine so your book your New Testament is a book of confusion people who read it they don't come out with the same argument that Jesus is divine as you are coming out with that means God if he is one he would have uh, if he is the author of the New Testament that's what you have he would have given explicit non-confusing knowledge to people who read it but we know that they are conflicting reports because I am suggesting some passages to you that he is not divine and you are suggesting passages to me which are vague that he is divine that means a person will come out with a view a contradictory view and God does not contradict and God does not confuse because of this confusion you see that there are so many sects in Christianity uh, according to one Christian scholar there are about 36,000 sects in Christianity alright John chapter number 5 verse number 30 let me refute that verse by presenting this verse to you this is from John chapter number 8 John chapter uh, Matthew chapter number 28 verse number 18 and this is the final nail in your coffin Sam Jesus Christ declares all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth who is giving that power God does not receive power from anyone human beings or prophets and messengers they receive power from God so again this verse 
Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 18, disqualifies Jesus Christ as being God because he's receiving power from somebody else, somebody higher than him. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth and God does not take power from anyone. He gives power. He gives miracles to other people. Alright, about the concept of Trinity that you worship or you believe, the dogma of Trinity. Let me quote you this from the Encyclopedia Britannica. It says, Neither the word Trinity nor the explicit doctrine appears in the New Testament, nor is Jesus and his followers intend to contradict the Shema in the Old Testament which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. This is the verse from Deuteronomy chapter number 6 verse number 4. And let me read you from the Oxford Companion to the Bible by Bruce Metzger. It says, Because the Trinity is such an important part of later Christian doctrine, it is striking that the term does not appear in the New Testament. Likewise, the developed concept of three co-equal partners in the Godhead found in later formulations cannot be clearly detected within the confines of the canon of the Bible. This, these are your own scholars, your own sources are saying that Trinity was developed later on. And let me quote one more. From the dictionary of the Bible it says, The Trinity of God is defined by the church as the belief in God as three persons who subsist, who subsist in one nature. That belief is so defined was reached only in the 4th and the 5th century AD and hence not an explicit formula of the Bible. I could go and quote you thousands of references from your own sources, your scholars, that it is not an explicit teaching of the New Testament. It is evolved way back after Jesus Christ was gone. And if Jesus Christ right now, if he came, he would be surprised, he would be a stranger in your own church because he himself says that he worships one God. He was praying to one God. He was prostrating to one God. In Mark, uh, Matthew chapter number 26, verse number 39, he was prostrating himself like Muslims prostrate to his God. And he's saying that not your will, uh, not my will, but your will. So God, he's, uh, Jesus Christ, he's praying to God and God does not pray to anyone. And even after all of these, my solid arguments against your confused Bible, the contradictory statements in the Bible, even if you say that Jesus Christ is God, you cannot, you cannot prove that these two gods, Jesus Christ and Father, that they are one and the same entity. You cannot prove that logically. Thus, you are stuck with the stigma that you are worshipping two gods. And because of this confusion, God cannot be an author of confusion, which is the New Testament. That is the reason many people are PMing me right now saying that I am a Christian and I don't take Jesus Christ as God. So what a contradictory book in which a person could come out reading from that book that Jesus is not God and Jesus is God. That is confusion and God is not the author of confusion. Arrest my case. And again, whatever, yeah, whatever argument that you bring in, know that all power is given to Jesus Christ by God, by His Father, so-called His Father. So you have committed many illogical uh, fallacies in your presentation, and I think I rest my case and I invite you to to worship one God, the God of Jesus. Thank you. Your turn. Uh, okay, let me know when to start. This is again.
I have to school this guy one more time. Let me know. What do you guys got? Yeah, it's five minutes now. Let me know when it starts. Let me know when to start. Okay, I'm ready. Okay, by the grace of God. Um, again, let me deal with some of the issues you brought up. It's not that I can't deal with them. The time is in your favor against me. Your arguments are very easily refuted. But again, let's come back to Matthew 28, 18. I'm going to try to answer your challenges point by point. You said that all power has been given unto me, <clears throat> all power in heaven and earth has been given unto me as a way of disproving the deed of Christ. Again, I guess you didn't hear what I said. I said that the Bible teaches Jesus is truly, fully, essentially God who became man. When he became man, he took the form of a slave. On earth, he subjected his will to the Father. He became the Father's servant. When it says, all power has been given to me, go look at your Greek lexicon. The word is exousia, which means authority. From the rank of a slave, he goes to the rank of the sovereign Lord of all creation, in rank, not in nature, because he went from the position of a lowly slave to the position of the exalted Lord. But using your logic, <clears throat> if we were to use your logic, that means the Father cannot be God, because according to the same scriptures, Jesus gives the Father something. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24. To receive something from another only demonstrates their distinct persons. It does not deny that they are essential deity. In 1 Corinthians 15, 24, just as the Father gave Christ a rule to rule, the Son will give the Father the authority to rule. 1 Corinthians 15, 24, then the end will come when He, Jesus, hands over the kingdom to God the Father after He has destroyed all dominion. Just like Christ giving the kingdom to the Father does not mean that the Father is not God, or less than Christ in essence, likewise, just because the Christ re that receives authority from the Father doesn't disprove his deity. Because Christ on earth was in the form of a slave. We believe Christ became man, and he existed in the form of a slave, doing the will of the Father until he accomplished the Father's will, and then was exalted back to glory, ruling creation sovereignly as the exalted Lord. In fact, this is what Jesus says in John 17, verse 5. You don't need to quote it. John 17, verse 5. And now, Father, glorify me with yourself, with the glory I had with you before the world was. Before the world was. Here Christ affirms that before the world, He existed in the same divine glory with the Father, and then came on earth, set aside His glory, and now to the bow to receive it again. Learn the scriptures, stop misquoting it. I know that this is what you like to do with your false book, but you won't do it to my book. Since my time is limited, let the field with me the first challenge. You said, nowhere does Jesus say he's God. Let me school you on this one. Revelation 21, 6-7. And by the way, your attack on the variant readings of the New Testament and then your appeal to scholars are more fallacies. You've introduced a red herring. The discussion is not the authority of the Bible, which I'll school you on in our next debate and show you that the Quran is corrupt. And it's not an appeal to us scholars. That's the fallacy of appealing to scholars. Scholars have many opinions. Give me the proof supporting the assertion of a scholar. But Revelation 21, 6 to 7. Again, the time is in your favor. Because I'll refute. In, in fact, we have more after this. Revelation 21, 21 to 7. Revelation 21, 6 to 7. Here is your challenge one. Let me shut it down and destroy it. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Mega the beginning and the end, to him who is thirsty I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. Now notice the speakers, the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And he will give us to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. Then the same speaker says, he who overcomes will inherit all this. I will be his God and he will be my son. So the speaker clearly says he's God. Now who is this God who is the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end? Well you don't need to guess, Revelation tells you. Revelation 22, 12 to 13. Revelation 22, 12 to 13. Who is this God who is the Alpha and the Magnum at the end? Revelation 22, 12 to 13. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is me. I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. 
So here's the one who's the Alpha and Omega, the first and last, the beginning and the end, who is our God. And he's God, who means coming. Who is the one coming? Revelation 22, verse 20. Revelation 22, verse 20. So stop misrepresenting the scriptures. Revelation 2, 20, verse 20. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus who comes says he's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And he is the one speaking who says he is our God. That's from the lips of Jesus. And let me correct another thing with my time uh, allotted to me. You keep saying that the Bible one place teaches that he's human, another place that teaches he's divine. That's precisely what I said. The Bible teaches that Jesus is God and man. It's not either or. That's the fallacy of your false dilemma. The Bible teaches both and. He's God and he's man. And he now here's from Mark where Jesus shows he knows everything. And he man, as man doesn't know everything, but as God he knows everything. My time is up. You're lucky. Easy refutation. Glory to God. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right, thanks a lot. Uh, yes, time is on my side because uh, I could say many things in just a few time because it's very easy to refute all of your arguments. I have done that. I posed you many challenges, and unfortunately, uh, Mr. Answering Islam, you were not able to come up with uh, any good answers. First of all, I challenge you whether Jesus Christ mentioned that he is God, and now you're telling me about revelation. When he is, well, don't post text right now. Maybe in the question and answer session you could uh, come up on the mic again. When he was on earth, in his first coming, not in a vision to John, not, you know, sometimes after he left. When he was on earth, he never mentioned that he is God. Okay? So my challenge, you are not able to meet. Sorry, you lost on that. Point number two. You mentioned that Jesus Christ, yes, he got something from the Father, that power is given to the Father, and Jesus Christ also could give something to the Father. With that illogical uh, fallacy that you have uh, committed, you are disqualifying uh, you know, the God, the Father of Jesus Christ as being God. Because Father, the God, does not receive anything from anyone. He's independent. But you have proved that since he is receiving something from God, from Jesus Christ, that he is less than God. So with that argument, you are disqualifying both Jesus and the Father as being God. Thirdly, I challenge you to prove it to me from Mark chapter number 13, verse number 32, that Jesus Christ, he's saying he does not have the foreknowledge. He doesn't have the foreknowledge. No human has the foreknowledge. And no angel has the foreknowledge. And he's saying no one. And he's saying only the Father has the foreknowledge. That means he, he's disqualifying himself, Jesus, and he's disqualifying Holy Spirit. And you could never come up with a sound and rational argument against it. And that's strike two against you. John chapter number 17, verse number 3. Again, Jesus Christ is mentioning that the Father is the only true God. I hope you understand proper English. You could go back to Greek if you want to. Only true God is mentioned by Jesus Christ to his Father. Again, you don't, you were not able to touch upon this, and this is strike number three for you. Strike number four. Three is enough, but I could be easy on you. Uh, let me give you some more strikes some more nails in your coffin. You are saying that God could come down as human being and still be God. That is illogical. A dependent and an independent cannot exist one and the same time simultaneously in a person. That is an illogical fallacy. Strike number five for you. Even if you could prove that Jesus is God, and that was my challenge to you, you were not even able to touch upon it. Even if you could prove that Jesus is God from the Bible, that means you have to admit that you are worshipping two gods. God, the Jesus, and God, the Father. That means you have to admit you are a polytheist, not a monotheist. 
point one, um, I should say strike number six against you answering Islam is I have given you the proof or the refutation of your Trinity argument from the Christian sources Encyclopedia Britannica, the New Catholic Encyclopedia, the Oxford Companion to the Bible and the Dictionary of the Bible, they all say the Trinity was formulated centuries after Jesus Christ was gone. So you are left with a dilemma, either you are a polytheist if you believe in your argument, that means you are not a monotheist, then you are going against the teaching of Jesus Christ. Secondly, because of the confusion of uh, the Bible, of the contradictory statements, that means many people are not coming up with the same thing of what you are saying that Jesus Christ is God. My time is up. I, I invite you to the God of Jesus Christ, Allah, and to Islam. Thank you very much, and may God bless all of you. Okay, now it's for interaction between Dao and myself. He keeps saying he struck me out. I think he was in another ballpark watching a different game. Now, Dawa, we enter into our interactive phase, where you and I are going to now ask you the other questions, and we will... We'll see who will answer what. I'm going to refute all your challenges in this phase. Are you ready? Interactive phase. No, that's not what we said. Don't run with your tail between your legs. I said in the even other room that we're going to debate and then we're going to interact with one another. That's part of the debate format. And then we open a question. Dawa, don't make excuses. You're not gonna run. It's being taped. Go ahead. Actually answering, if you move up the text all the way up, look at the format which I have presented and you have agreed. 15 minutes, 10 minutes, 5 minutes, then question and answer. Question and answer. And I have mentioned specifically at that time, question and answer by the audience. You did your best, sorry, not able to, uh, not able to defend yourself, your point. I think that was it between me and you. Now let people ask. Off of Fantasy Island, you got schooled badly. Stop making excuses. So don't come up here and say, I did my best. It's tape. Again, so don't run from the challenge. Question and answers doesn't preclude you and I asking each other questions and answers. If you remember, in the other room I says, I want to interact with you. Don't run with cold feet, guy. If you think you did that good, then take me on face to face. This is what I ask. I ask a debate and eight interaction and then question and answer. In fact, people in the room, let's see. Would you guys like to see Dao and myself do 20 minutes of interaction between one another where we ask each other questions and answer? Raise your hands in the room. Because now Dawa is making the lame excuse that I said question and answers. Dawa, the question and answers include me asking you and you asking me. And I even stated that in the other room. Now Dawa, say face. You think you won, which you didn't. You lost. But now say face. We want the interaction. That was part of the agreement. Dawa, don't come here and give me... Now here, even some of your Muslims want it. How many people want me and Dawa now to interact and then open the questions to the floor? Dawa, one more chance at the mic. Don't run, buddy. Because you got school, I'm going to school you some more. How many want us to interact? Raise your hands. Go ahead, Dawa. Your mic. Sam, I don't mind we having live interaction for 20 minutes. It doesn't mind for half an hour. Even though it was not the original, it was not the original agreement, I could still take you on it, all right? You could take a shot at me one more time, even though it was not. Show me where does it say on the text all the way, go up all the way in the text and say 20 minutes of life interaction. But fire, I will take him. You're getting me aggravated. Do you remember in the room where I said, you and I will interact one-on-one? -on -one? 
And when you say question and answers, that includes you and I asking questions and answering. Stop making excuses. You just said you don't mind. Let's get it on. Do you want to ask the first question or do I ask the first question? Let me know. Do you want to ask the first question I ask the first? We're going to do 20 minutes back and forth. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, first question. I'm going to get, now, let's set up the rules, though. Hold on. Let's set up the rules. One minute for a question. How many minutes do you want for a response? How many minutes do you want for a response, Dawa? You sure you want one? Or do you want to make it two minutes and then a counter response? Do you want a question, response, and counter response? Dawa, tell me. Question, response, counter response, or no? Let me know. And then, you guys, you can put your... Okay, one, two, one. All right, put your hands down, people. Guys, put your hands up. Dow on me. You want to do it for 20 minutes straight or 30 minutes? 20 minutes or 30 minutes straight? Guys, please put your hands down. What, 20 minutes or 30 minutes? All right. 20 is fine. Okay. My first question, please, guys, begin timing. Begin timing. Okay, let's go now. Dawa, here's my question. You quoted sources regarding the formulation of the doctrine of the Trinity not found in the Scriptures, and that the word Trinity is not found in the Scriptures. Here's my question to you. Since you believe in Tawheed and the three classifications of Tawheed, Tawheed al-Rububiyah, Tawheed al-Asma wa Sifat, which is the third level, and Tawheed al-Ibadat, excuse my mispronunciation, please show me in the entire Quran, here's my challenge to you, show me the word Tawheed, and show me the three classifications of Tawheed from the Quran alone. Show me that, please. Here's my challenge. Let me restate it. Show me the word Tawheed and the three classifications of Tawheed from the Quran. If it's not there, tell me where did you come up with it and what was the date these terms were used. Your mic, two minutes, time him. All right, very good question. When we do the debate on the Quran, you could ask, you could ask this question. The, what we are discussing right now is Trinity, which includes Jesus Christ as being God. Yes, yes. We are not discussing my belief, and we are not dis and we are not discussing the Quran. We are discussing the Trinity, and I gave you enough references. And I gave you enough references from the scholars and from the Bible to disprove to disprove that Jesus Christ cannot be God and Trinity was formulated centuries after he was gone so don't try to shift the topic here don't try to shift the you know the what we are discussing stick with the Bible and stick with Trinity when we come to the Quran we will discuss this inshallah alright so don't try to make that uh, circular argument so go ahead, stick with the topic, and uh, you can't refute what I have uh, mentioned so far. Try your best. Go ahead, yield your mic. Thank you for evading your responsibility and answering the question, which demonstrates you're afraid. And believe me, when we debate the Quran, I am going to hammer this point. It's not irrelevant to the topic. The topic is the unity of God from the scriptures. You're imposing a criteria against the Bible that you wouldn't use against the Quran because you know the Quran would fail. So you're inconsistent and dishonest in your methodology. Now let me share with everyone why you couldn't answer that. The fact of the matter is there's not, in, in, not a single verse of the entire Quran where the word Tawheed is mentioned or the three classifications of Tawheed. This was a formulation centuries after Muhammad died by Muslim scholars who felt that this classification best represented what the Quran taught. Likewise, because you didn't get the point of my question, so now I'm going to school you on this. Likewise, the term Trinity and the formulation of the doctrine is an attempt to describe what the Bible clearly teaches. Neither the word Trinity or the doctrine has to be in the Bible for the Bible to teach the Trinity. So, Dawa, thanks for running with your cold feet. Bring up your question so I can school you some more.
I think you got the title wrong. The title was, Is Jesus God? So don't try to uh, bring a new title and try to fool the people. The title, original title of the debate is Jesus God, which includes Trinity. It does not include the Quran. It does not include my Tawheed. So don't try to run away from my questions and my challenges. You have tried your best. Okay, let me ask my question. Again, my challenge to you. Okay, yeah, you could start the time now. Again, my challenge to you. Even if you could prove that Jesus is God, if you believe that Jesus is God, you cannot prove that they are one and the same person. Proof means logical proof that Jesus Christ and Father are both God, distinct, distinct person and God, and they could be both one and the same. It has to be logical, not some scriptural what you believe. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, time me. Now let me catch you in your gross error. It's being taped. This is why I say you don't know the scripture, and this is why you made all these fallacies galore. You just said for me to prove to you that Jesus and the Father can be are, are the same person. You said person. Nowhere did I say I believe the Father and the Son are the same person. I clearly said Father and Son are distinct persons. It's recorded. It's on tape. Thank you for showing me that you don't understand what we believe, so you need to misrepresent it. Now, coming about lo talking about logic, I, a I already explained to you earlier your gross logical fallacy of the cate categorical fallacy. You keep likening the three persons to the one, uh, being one God to a squared circle. Let me repeat it so you can understand it. A square and a circle belong to the same category. Therefore, two things that belong to the same category can't be simultaneously uh, the same. That's true. But you can have two things from different categories that can unite, such as the category of shapes and colors, a red square, a yellow circle. Likewise, God and man are two different categories. And since God is capable of becoming man without ceasing to be God, and stop misrepresenting me, I never said God ceased to have his divine attributes. In my debate, I showed that Christ, while on earth, had all his omni-attributes, while still having human attributes, two different categories simultaneously united in one person. So learn logic before you try to use it. Learn logic before you try to use it. Because you're embarrassing yourself with your logical fallacies. And if you want a re reference from Scripture that the Father and Son are distinct persons but one God, one in essence, I'll show you that. Okay, is my time up? What am I doing with time? Go ahead, your one minute rebuttal. In your opening statement, you mentioned that there are two distinct human beings. Yes, if you are recording it, I am recording it too, so beware. You mentioned that there are distinct human beings. So if Jesus Christ, who is a distinct human being, if he is God, and Father, who is a distinct uh, person or entity, okay, not human being, dis distinct entity, uh, he's God, and Father is a distinct entity, and he's God, you have proven my point. You are proving that there are two gods. That's the whole point, that you are a polytheist, that you are worshipping two gods. So if you prove it to us that Jesus Christ is God, that means you are a polytheist. Okay? That's, that's what you have to believe. Secondly, my challenge still stands. My... Um, I believe I have uh, one minute of rebuttal. My challenge still stands. That Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he excluded himself from Mark chapter number, Mark chapter number 13, verse number 32. Who, he excludes himself and the Holy Spirit and man and angel from being all-knowing. He only includes the Father. What is my question? My Hold on. Are you asking me your question? Or are you answering me? Are you asking me your question? Answer. This was a minute rebuttal to my response to your, to your question. Are you asking me a question? You need to ask me a question when it's your turn. And I'll answer that. Ask me that when it's your turn to ask the question. 
You asked me a question. I responded. You had a minute response. Now it's my turn to ask you a question. Stop getting anxious. I'm going to refute you easily. Believe me. And you misrepresent. I didn't say there were two human beings or two distinct beings. Go back and listen to the tape. Now it's my turn to ask the question. Is that clear? I asked the question. You have two minute rebuttal. I have a one minute response. You asked the question. You asked the question. Two minute rebuttal. One minute response. Are you ready for my question? Are you ready for my question? Okay. Now, okay, guys, get ready. You mentioned Mark chapter 13, verse 32, that there Jesus excludes the Holy Spirit. I guess you didn't get my response or deliberately ignored it. When Jesus says, no one knows, if that term meant to include everyone, why does Jesus go on and differ differentiate between the category of no one from the, whole, from the angels and the Son? In other words, here's my question. If the term no one knows includes everyone, what need was there for Christ to go on and qualify a statement and say, neither the angels nor the Son, when the term no one would have included them? Unless, of course, no one in, in context refers to no human being because Christ was addressing his conversation to human beings. So again, can you explain that? Why, if the term no one includes everyone, why does Jesus go on and qualify and says, neither the angels nor the Son? And why didn't he mention the Holy Spirit since he made the qualification? Please answer that question. You have two minutes. Keep the time. Again, even if you look at the context answering of Mark 13, 32, Jesus Christ mentions no one. Then he goes on to say no human being. He was not just addressing to the human beings. About the foreknowledge, he says no one no human being, neither the Son, which means He Himself, and neither any angel, but only the Father. I know you are making a circular reasoning about this verse, but you could never come up with the statement, or you could never refute that this verse disqualifies with all the context, with all the context that you, you could bring in. It disqualifies Jesus Christ as knowing the future. If you think he is God, he should have known the future, he does not. And also it disqualifies the Holy Spirit as being knowing the future and, and as being God. Because Jesus Christ could have mentioned the name of Holy Spirit along with the Father, he did not. And you lost. You could take a shot again if you want. And uh, okay, I think it's, uh, you could re refute if you want. Or else I have my next question for you. Again, I'm going to show you how badly you're doing, even though you think that uh, you're proving your point. You just misquoted the scripture again, it's being recorded. You said, Jesus says, no one knows, and then he says, no human being. Here's the verse. Stop misquoting it in my presence. He says, no one knows about the their hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. So again, you're misrepresenting and misquoting my scriptures and, and embarrassing yourself. The fact that he says no one knows and doesn't go on to mention humans proves my point. And if no one includes even the Holy Spirit, why does Jesus mention the angels and the Son, but does not mention the Holy Spirit? If no one knows means everyone, then he didn't need to mention angels or the Son. But if no one knows means everyone and he wants to qualify it, the fact that he didn't mention the Spirit refutes you badly. So stop misquoting my scriptures and learn logic and read my text carefully. This actually refutes you. There's no need to mention the Spirit because the subject's not about the Spirit. It's about humans, angels, and the Son. And since the Spirit knows the Father's mind and belongs to the Father, He's all-knowing, per 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. If you want to ask me about Mark 13, 32 and the omniscience of the Son, please go ahead. It's your turn. So again, stop misquoting. You're embarrassing yourself. It's on tape. Go ahead. Good thing you're recording this, okay? Good thing you're recording this, because this will be against you right now in front of everyone, and later on then you will uh, uh, listen to it, and on the Day of Judgment. All right, uh, let my time start. My question to you again is, 
even if you could prove that Jesus Christ is God, then you are stuck with the dilemma that you are worshipping two gods. Father as being God and Jesus Christ as being God. And you could never prove that these two distinct entities are one and the same. Logically prove that these two gods that you worship, Jesus Christ as being God and Father as being God, that they are both one and the same person logically because when Jesus Christ when he was on the cross and father he was up there or out there they are two di distinct entities and if you claim that both of them are God that means you are stuck with the dilemma I have to repeat this again and again that you are worshipping two gods you could try your best in your heart of hearts if you say that Jesus Christ is God that means you are worshipping two gods Alright, so you could never answer that. You have to prove logically that two things could be one and the same. Two gods could be one and the same God. And Sarah, I could come up with uh, my comments on John chapter number 10, verse number 30. You could bring it up on the time when we have question and answers from the audience. You could bring that verse up. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, make sure to bring it up so I can school him when he appeals to John 17:11. Now let me come back. First of all, I don't believe there are two gods. And when you say the one and the same, they're the one and the same. One and the same what? One and the same being. One and the same person. One and the same essence. One and the same attribute. It is you who don't know logic. You keep committing logical fallacies. The fallacy that you're operating under is that Unless God is one person, he can't be one God. Who says so? Let me again repeat my point because you didn't listen to it. If it's possible for God to be one in one sense and more than one in another sense, then how is this a logical fallacy? You agree with me that God, although one in being, is also a plurality of attributes. If he can be a plurality of attributes, why can't he be a plurality of persons and still be one being? The error you're committing is in your definition of one. One what? You can have one community, one committee, one being. But one does not preclude unity and plurality. You're uh, grossly assuming that one here means singularity. But define your terms. Stop committing logical fallacies and word games. You can have God as one being and more than one person who share this being. And you have that in creation all the time. You have one cube with six squares. One to the third power is still one. One times one times one is still one. If finite creatures can be plurality and unity, how much more the incomprehensible God who's above and beyond us and unlike us? Learn logic, friend. You're embarrassing yourself. My time is up. Go ahead. Your one-minute rebuttal. Answering, I think you dropped your mic. Are you done with it? I could refute. Or else. Dawah answering Islam, he spoke, we all heard him. If you didn't hear him, I'll give him the time again to come up and explain that to you. So you tell me, if you need to reboot or restart, let us know. So at least we all will be reading out of the same page. All right, uh, assalamu alaikum everyone again. All right, what's your logic, okay? I'm amazed that you are, you know, about your logic. You are saying that God could have different attributes and uh, then, you know, he could, uh, he could uh, transform himself into a human being and could still retain his attributes. That's a fallacy and I try to explain that to you logically that cannot be possible. A human, a, an entity cannot be 
dependent and independent one and the same time. Nobody's lying. I'm just telling you an entity cannot be dependent. I just started. Hello, fire. I just started. Right. I only spoke like two or three sentences. Okay, let me just wrap up that sentence. An entity cannot be... Okay, fine. Go ahead. Okay, now you asked me a question and I answered and you had a rebuttal. Now it's time for my question. Hold on. Okay, now I need you to explain this for me. Um, someone can post a text for me. Uh, can you tell me what is your view of John 17, 23 and 26? John 17, 23 and 26 and John 14, 23. This is the same gospel of John that you quoted in John 5, 30 and misquoted. But here, I want you to answer these passages for me. In John 17, 23 and 26, and John 14, 23, Jesus says, He lives in all believers, and He and the Father together will come to believers and make His home with them, claiming to be omnipresent like the Father and co-equal with Him. Could you please explain to me why these passages do not demonstrate the omni-attributes of Christ on earth? Could you explain that? He says He lives in all believers, He will live with them, and He and the Father together will make their home with us showing he's co-equal to the Father. This is the same John that you've been wrenching out of context. Please explain that to me. Alright, there could be two different recitations of this. First of all, even if Jesus Christ had that power, according to you, if he has that power, that power was given to him by God. If that's a miracle, we should praise God and worship God and not the person who is doing the miracle. Secondly, somebody dwelling within you, it could be taken up in many different ways. My father passed away, but he's still with me. In one sense, he's still with me. Does it mean that he's ever living, that he's existing right now with me? So dwelling or living or being with somebody does not mean that literally that person is there uh, with that group or with that person. tell which words. I was just answering what um, Answering Islam was saying. John 17 verse 23, yes. All those verses, they are refutations to those verses. That means Bible is contradictory. That's my whole point. And my point is people who read the Bible comes up with contradictory statements. And God does not confuse, but Bible does. That means Bible cannot be the word of God. You could refute your one minute, then I will come back and have a question for you. And I think that may be the last question, then we could take some questions from uh, the people who has uh, their hands raised here. Um, let us know how much time we have for interaction. And my time begins to respond. Again, you didn't hear me. You didn't hear what I said. This is the problem throughout the debate. You keep thinking you hear something which I didn't, which I didn't say. I said Jesus says that like the Father, He will make our home with us. So however the Father makes His home with us, Jesus says He makes His home in the same way. Co-equality. And then you just said in front of everyone that God gave Christ the attribute of omnipresence. So now who's committing the logical fallacy? How can God make a creature omnipresent? Omnipresence is an attribute of God alone in distinction from creation. Thank you for showing that you have no answers, have no answers to my point. It's recorded. You said that this is a miracle of God, that God gave it to him. Everyone heard it. Stop lying. Stop filibustering. You do not give a creature omnipresence when that's an attribute of the creator in distinction from the creature. So again, Jesus says he's with us in the same sense that the Father is. And in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says he's with us to the end of the age. Come up with better responses because it's hurting your case. Your question. Go ahead. And it's a question. It's a question. Yes, it's a question. All throughout the debate. Okay, this is so funny, I would say. Uh, both people who are listening up here. 
that answering Islam is trying to prove that a distinct entity who is God, Jesus Christ, he's trying to prove that Jesus Christ is God, then we have a distinct entity, Father, and he is saying, and obviously he believed that he is God too. Well, he tried. So my question now again, this is my final question, then obviously we could take the question, okay, my final question again. The two gods that you are trying to prove, Jesus and Father, you could never prove that they are one and the same God, one God. And Jesus Christ is not an attribute of God, that's your false reasoning, false logic. Don't try to mix up attributes and, uh, and distinct entities. Jesus Christ is a di distinct entity, he's not an attribute of God. So my question again to you is, yeah, let me finish up with the question. Proof that the two distinct entities are one and the same entity from logical. Logically prove it. The two gods that you're trying to prove that they're one and the same God. Logically. And try your best shot now. Actually, I've tried my best shot and it's actually wiped the floor with you, you haven't been able to respond. Logically, I said, logically, I said, and first let me correct something, I didn't say Jesus is an attribute of God. Logically, I said, you keep coming, committing the fallacy, and I thank God it's on tape, so that people can see that you're a master of logical fallacies. You keep saying that to show you from logic, two things can be one. And I keep coming back, what do you mean by one? When you say one God, in what way is God one? Both the Bible and the Quran agree that God is unlike anything in creation. And the triunity is unlike anything in creation, demonstrating clearly that this is something from God, because there are no triune beings. I kept saying that you can be one in one sense and one in a different sense. If God can have a plurality of persons, show me logically why he can't be a plurality of persons. I'm sorry. I said if God... Uh, can have a plurality of attributes. Show me logically why he can't have a plurality of persons and still be one being. God can be one in one sense and more than one in another sense. Just like in creation you can have one, one cube, six squares. To be one cube doesn't preclude it being six squares. Again, plurality and with unity, stop committing the fallacy of assuming unity means singularity. It is your fallacy, not mine. You have one minute's response, and I have another question. Well, I believe that was the last question. Let me finish up with uh, let me finish up with my rebuttal to it. You were saying that why can't God have uh, three persons, and all of them could be one? Or you know, I'm just paraphrasing you. If not, uh, you could type up on the text and tell me. You are saying that why can't God be three different entities and still one God? That's the whole gist of your argument today. That's what I wanted to prove. And you're not proving, you're just stating. Why can't it be? Why can't it be? Because, well, three different persons. Yes, three different persons. If you could prove that all three persons are God, that means you have, proved, you have proven in front of all of us that you are a polytheist that you believe in three gods because three gods cannot be one god okay they all cannot combine to be one god because you have mentioned in your opening statement that they are distinct entities distinct persons so with that i would wrap up and my last sentence is you have failed and i welcome you to islam thank you very much Brother, the furthest, furthest thing I've done is fail. You got beat miserably. It's on tape. You, like Nadir, are also in Fantasy Island. But the tape speaks for itself. Now, I have one question. Let me further expose why you're, you're a master of logical fallacies and can't deal with the text. I spent the whole time demonstrating from Scripture the plurality of persons within God. And then you want logic, I gave it to you. But no, I said I had one question. It was in the text. Here's my final question to you. And I need you to answer this, because you're too afraid to go outside of the Bible, because you know I'll school you on the Quran. Let me give you a final question. I need you to address this for me. Please, address this for me. 
in John 10, 27, and all the way to 29, John 10, 27 to 29, Jesus says this, John 10, 27, 29, hear my question carefully, don't misrepresent me. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, I give them eternal life. I give them eternal life. Not someone else, I give them eternal life. They, they shall never perish. No one can pluck them out of my hand. No one can pluck them out of my hand. Jesus says he gives eternal life and that no one can pluck them out of his hand. Then he says, my father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. No one can pluck them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. In context, Jesus says he gives eternal life and there's no power for it to deliver out of his hand. Just like there's no power to pluck out of his, uh, his hand and the father's hand. So Jesus says, like the Father, no one can pluck out of his hand, and Jesus gives eternal life. In Deuteronomy 32:39, Deuteronomy 32:39, the Old Testament says that Jehovah God, to prove that He is God, and to show that no one else is, He says He gives life, and no one can pluck out of His hand. That's Deuteronomy 32:39. He is God, and no one can pluck out of His hand. Explain to me how is it that Jesus contains the very attributes of Jehovah God in Deuteronomy 32:39? Do what he does. You have a minute. Come and answer. <laughs> what can I say? You keep on repeating the same fallacy. Who gives the power to Jesus Christ? Your Bible says, Jesus declares, all power is given unto me in heaven. So whatever power that you will bring of Jesus Christ is given by God to Jesus Christ. And you could try your best to prove that Jesus Christ is God. That means, once you have proven that Jesus Christ is God, that means you have to label yourself as a polytheist. And you could never prove that the two entities who are both God could be one and the same God. Logically, you cannot prove it. And Sarah, later on I could answer that question to you, 1 times 1 times 1 equals 1. How many people do you see in this room up here? If you, with the same logic, with the same logic, there would be only one person here. You could multiply me and John and A.B. and Fisher, one times one times one, you would come up with the logic of only one person. Okay? So that doesn't go anywhere, Sarah. And Sam, you have to either make yourself as a polytheist, worshipping in two gods, but trying your best to prove that Jesus Christ is God, or you have to open your eyes and see Jesus Christ as what he is in the Bible. He is a human being, a prophet, doing miracles by God and worshipping one God. And to this God, I invite you to worship. Thank you very much. And I think our question and answers are over. And uh, I am ready to take any questions from the audience or any comments. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sarah and... Uh, Answering Islam and the Christian night, night's interaction. And uh, yeah, you could have uh, the one minute response. Uh, and uh, yeah, may God uh, guide all of you. Thank you very much. Uh, just let me re quickly respond. The fact is, we worship the one God, but Allah is a false God. So you're worshiping a false God, you need to repent. Secondly, I answered Matthew 28:18, but let me answer it again because you can't understand the, my answer. Matthew 28, 18, I said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Read the Greek text, see what the word is, see the context. Jesus on earth in the form of the slave came to fulfill the will of the Father. Yet the same Jesus, being God, has all the attributes of God and can do what God alone can do. This is why I said, explain to me, why did Jesus say he can do the things that Jehovah God says he alone can do? I.e., because he is God, distinct from the Father, existing as one God. And you keep saying I'm a polytheist. Actually, it is you who are the pagan polyist, poly, polytheist worshipping a false god. We worship one god, one eternal being, yet this being does not preclude a plurality of attributes or persons. One eternal being existing in three persons simultaneously, the one true God, Jesus Christ. I invite you to repent of worshipping the false god, Allah, and worship the true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Jesus is Lord, an easy victory by the grace of God. Let's open up to the question and answers. Let's now agree how we're going to do the format. I'll be right back. Give me a minute.
Sarah, do you want me to respond to your uh, one times one? I think I already responded that uh, if you want to uh, take up the mic and uh, tell me why is that not true. Um, my response to your one times one times one equals one uh, argument is, if you use the same argument to the number of people that we have in this room right now, you would end up with only one person. Yeah, but you cannot use that analogy of a tree and the leaves because uh, the trees have different, uh, the branch, the clove, it has different attribute than the leaves and each leaf has a different attribute. Okay, if you think that I am three, then can you define it to me, uh, the difference between a spirit and a soul? Then we could proceed with that argument. But anyway, we could take the questions, inshallah. I think John is uh, next in line, and it would be great uh, to uh, take up uh, his question. Thanks, John. Go ahead. Hold on, guys. Hold on. I, I said I'd be right back. I had to do something. And I, we didn't agree to the format. How's this format going to be done? Is uh, qu How many minutes for the question? How many end minutes for the response? And does the other party get a response? You took a question without me, without me knowing. What's the format? Can someone agree to a format? One minute for a question? One minute for a question? Is it one minute for a question? Can someone agree with me? Take a minute for a question. John is next, by the way. I didn't mean to knock him off. Can someone tell me in the text? Is it a minute for a question? How many minutes for rebuttal? And does the other party have a counter response? Can anyone tell me? Can you hear me, guys? I don't see nothing in the text. Sarah, hello? Anyone can hear me? Dawa, the best is still complete, complete time. Stop being logically absurd here. It is different only that's past, but it's still complete, complete time, and that's the point. Anyway, how are we going to do this? Okay, Dawa, do you agree? Is it one minute for the question? Two minutes for an answer, one minute for a rebuttal. Dawa, do you agree? Put in the text so I can know. Can you put in the text so I can know? Dawa, I'm talking to you guys. One minute for the question, two minutes and for the answer, and one minute for the rebuttal. Okay. John, you're next. Go ahead. John, you're next. By the way, if anyone else wants to ask a question, you got to unread dot them. you got to unread, un, unread dot them. If there are people who want to ask a question, raise your hand. Raise your hand, and you got to be on red dotted. Go ahead. Um, Sarah, unread dot the room. I can't hear anybody. Unread dot the room. And unread dot them. Okay, people want to ask questions, come to the mic. Raise your hand. People for questions, come to the mic. Raise your hand. John is next. Sarah, are you here? Can people hear me? I see nothing in the text. Christian Knight, somebody unread dot the room, please. Christian Knight, somebody unread dot the room. Okay, John is John next. John is next. Okay, line up for the question. If we can alternate between myself and Dawa, that'd be fair. One question for him, one question for there me, and for any questions for me. Thank you, Free Spirit. Jesus is Lord. Demonstrate it easily again. Another defeat for the Muslims. Go ahead, John, you're first. Okay, thank you, Lansing. Administrator, cut me off when my time is up. But my question, you had mentioned previously, uh, Dawa, uh, is Jesus is God, and then I'm going to ask you something. G uh, Christ is, is the uh, uh, visible image of the invisible God. He existed before God made anything at all and is supreme of all creation. Christ is the one through whom God created everything in heaven and earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, kings, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities. 
Everything has been created through him and for him. He existed before everything else began. That means the Koran, Islam, Muhammad, and Jesus holds all creation together. Now, if this is true, the, my question to you is that Jesus Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament 2,000 some years before uh, your uh, Islamic religion and the Koran that was ever conjured up from the abyss. My question to you is that if it's the same God, if we are the same God, then why is not Muhammad prophesied in the Old Testament? Uh, can you answer that? Zawa, are you there? It's your turn to ask. We can't hear you. Can you raise your hand? Are you there? Guys, please, keep the question to a minute. Two-minute response, and then a minute rebuttal. Zawa, go ahead. It's your mic. By the way, let me just make one rule. Questions have to be relevant to the topic. The topic is, is Jesus God according to the Scripture? John asked a question regarding Muhammad in the Bible. I would say that's not relevant to the topic. Now, Zawa, Q can answer that, or we can have a debate on that and show you what the Bible says. So go ahead, Dawa. Oh, it's up to you. It's not related to the subject. So let me again. Questions have to be pertinent to the subject. So Dawa. It's not related to the subject. So let me again. Questions have to be pertinent to the subject. So Dawa. Yeah, I got it answering. Uh, yeah, I think that question is not relevant. That will open up a whole new topic about the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad uh, mentioned in the Bible. So I would pass that question, if, uh, but uh, to be fair, the next person uh, could ask me any question that they want. Okay, go ahead. Yes, hello everybody. Uh, well, Dawa, you are an impressive debater. You're a Muslim, yet you are very intellectual. Uh, and uh, it is surprising it's a rarity in Islam uh, because Islam as we know it produce uh, 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 individuals who are at least too far away from being so intellectual uh, unfortunately Islam has not produced any better uh, Muslims however uh, believe that God is an almighty yet yet they find it extremely difficult to understand God who is an almighty uh, cannot cannot uh, be a human being without seizing God I find that extremely uh, difficult to comprehend why is it God who is almighty cannot be a human being without ceasing to be God. Why is it so difficult to understand? Uh, using the same logic, uh, it's as if we're saying uh, uh, God cannot be a human being if he so chooses. Cannot be a human being if he so chooses. Which actually... Uh, uh, relates in inadequacy adequacy to God uh, using the same logic we uh, could also say a cube cannot have six faces or six surfaces why is it so difficult Islam itself was which was uh, uh, incidentally written by an historic heresy uh, follower a name uh, fire you're taking more than the allotted time I mean, Fisher, I'm sorry, not Fire. Fisher, you're taking more than the other time. Please respect the rules. One minute for a question. This is not a sermon or a speech. One minute for the questions. Dawa, did you get... Uh, uh, did you get...
the question, put a one. Did you understand his question? Put a one in the text. Dawa, okay. Go ahead, go ahead. Dawa. Two, you got minutes. Please keep time of the question and answer. Two minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, Fisher, my friend, that's a very good question. I uh, do thank you for your compliments and uh, other people's compliments uh, on this good job on the debate. I praise that to Allah uh, for his assistance. All right, coming to your questions, why cannot God come down as a human being? God, if he chose to, he could come down. But once he becomes a human being, he's no longer God. That's the whole point. And point number two. Why cannot God come down in the form of a mice? Fisher, do you know in India that they believe there is a temple, there is a temple in India in which they believe that God incarnated in the form of a mice and they worship mice. Go to India, there is one temple. Their God is mice and they believe just like you believe that uh, God came down in the form of a mice and they have statues of mice and all the mice are there and they're worshipping it. So what's the difference between them, those Hindus who are worshipping mice, and you when you are saying that God could come down as a human being and still be God? Because it is illogical for an independent and a dependent being to be in one and the same place, in one entity. That's what I'm trying to prove. So, yes, if God, once he comes down, he will no longer be God. He could only be a human being because now he is dependent with all the human attributes of being dependent on, you know, uh, on somebody else. He has to eat, he has to go to the washroom, he has to uh, sleep and all the human attributes. So God will cease to be God once he comes down as a human being. Well, Pat, so you could ask that question on the mic. So again, why don't you worship God in the form of a human uh, mice like Hindus do? What's the difference between you and Hindus? They also believe in the incarnation of God so many times in the form of human beings, in the form of uh, many animals. Okay, thank you very much. My question is also to Dawa, to the world. Uh, Jesus forgave sins, and we know that only God... Fire, why are you jumping the mic? I have a minute rebuttal, Fire. And are you anxious? Calm down. I have a minute rebuttal. Let me now address this. I'm glad that Dawah could admit and acknowledge that God can become a human being. The fallacy he commits is that... Of me. Explain to me... Explain to me... Logically, biblically, or Quranically... Why God can't take on human nature and still remain God? Why God can't take on human nature and still remain God? The fallacy he keeps you committing is the fallacy of false dilemma. You keep falsely assuming for God to take on human nature means he ceases to be God. And we keep trying to tell you that's the fallacy of your own imagination, not supported in the scriptures, nor is it supported in your own book. For example, in Genesis 18, 1-33, and Genesis 32, 24 to 30. Genesis 18, 1 to 33. Genesis 32, 24 to 30. There the God of Abraham, the God in the Old Testament, appears as a man, and he's still God. He appears as a man, he eats what Abraham offers to him, and he's still fully God. Because becoming man, God doesn't cease to be God. Stop committing this fallacy of false dilemma. It gets you nowhere. Anyway, Fire, it's your turn. Go ahead, your question. Thank you, answering. I'm sorry, I didn't, I forgot about your rebuttal. Uh, only God can forgive sins, and Jesus forgave sins. And he also raised the dead and healed the sick. And uh, for you to say that he, he was not God, the Bible says that he thought it not robbery to call himself equal to God. And um, your, your, um, so that's my question to you. <clears throat> Nobody else for, can forgive sins but God. So Jesus is God. Thank you.
All right, I assume that question is for me. Well, again, uh, if you have been here in this uh, long interaction, I have shown to answering Islam that whatever power that Jesus Christ has, all the miracles and the power to forgive sins and anything that uh, Jesus Christ could do, those are all coming from God. Okay, plain and simple. The power to forgive sins, if you are saying that Jesus could forgive sins, that means that power is coming from God and have posted that verse again, let me post it. Sorry, drop my mic. All power is given to Jesus Christ. That means the power to forgive sins was also given to Jesus Christ. By who? By God. And to that God we worship and I invite you to worship that God too. Thank you. Okay, again I'm going to have to repeat myself as I've done throughout the debate. Matthew 28:18 does not prove your case. I kept saying that Christ on earth was in the form of a slave, a slave and upon the resurrection he was given the authority to rule. But how can a finite creature rule all creation so the verse backfires against you how can a finite creature, creature rule all creation well if you go on and read because he's God in Matthew 28 20 says, and surely I am with you always to the end of the age omnipresent again another quality of God so Matthew 28 18 backfires against you secondly it is not true that Jesus forgave because he was given authority from the Father alone Jesus working in perfect union with the Father does all things perfectly and consistently with the Father. Yet because Jesus is God, He has the authority to have others forgive in His name. In Luke 10, 17-20, Luke 5, 20-25, Luke 10, 17-20, Luke 5, 20-25, and Luke 24, 47. This is all from Jesus. Luke 10, 17-20, Luke 5, 20-25, and Luke 24, 47. Jesus says, I have given you the authority to forgive sins in my name. I give you authority to do it in my name. That's the name of God Almighty. Read scripture and click on, stop misquoting it, that proved our case and refuted you. Yes, because Jesus does forgive sins, he is God. And because he's God, he can give others the authority to forgive in his name. Glory to God. So you refute it again. Go ahead, Shimon. Shimon, you got a bad mic, no voice. Shimon, I keep saying Shimon. Voice, no voice. question? Would you want to write it in text? You have, you have no voice. Okay, well, okay. If you want to write your question in text, let me know. Don't write it. We'll let Seeker go next. Go ahead, Seeker. Yes, I don't know what uh, your stand on this is. It uh, seems like it might be Trinitarian, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not Trinitarian, nor am I oneness, uh, but I am Christian. And uh, so uh, my uh, question would be uh, the scripture that I'm posting right now, John 20:17. Jesus clearly tells us that he has a God. And um, so that's just the way I see it. I'd like to see uh, what your answer to John 20:17 is. Okay, that's very easy. Guys, please keep me, uh, time, time me, begin. Uh, John 20:17 part is part of a greater context of the Gospel of John. The same Gospel of John in John 1, 1 to 3 demonstrates that the eternal word was God and was having communion with another called the God, who is the Father. This word in verse 14 became flesh and dwelt among us. When the God is good, who were in us, come be sin, and a man part of us become to be creation without ceasing, as God in us. As the God to be 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 God
is God Father Father, because it's not either or, or either is God is Jesus God and man. He is and simultaneously. He's man and as and part and he relates to all the things as his God. So there's no problem. But reading in the written you can John 28, he is 30 to 21. John 20, 28 to 31. I hope my voice is coming in clearly. To Jesus, it says, it's these Thomas, Tom, Tom, who said in, Thomas, my Lord and my God. Now, if Thomas was exclaiming, late surprise, then blood be coming from him. He was taking the Lord's name in vain. Coming, Mike, I'm being clear, hold on. Voice check, hold on. Is my voice coming clear? Is, okay, okay. Sorry. I was, I was, I was,